I thought we were the protectors of truth. Democrats, Republicans, you all lie. We, a small band of survivors, are on our way to the Steel City to find the resistance. Join us. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance with Senior Airman Ward Miller and the ironclad voice of Pittsburgh, Hutch Jr., laying down verbal C4 to blow away the lies and the political tomfoolery. Your papers have been cleared. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Steel City Resistance. My name is Hutch Jr. I'm located in the neighborhood of Brookline in the city of Pittsburgh, deep, deep, deep down in the bunker. And I'm Ward Miller, also in the city of Pittsburgh here in Mission Control. Uh, this week's episode is going to be, well, we said every week it's going to be long, but we'll probably try and get it to jam into the one hour time allotted. Yeah, we're going to have to have a, a couple shows a week or something at this rate. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it's getting just downright ridiculous. I mean, uh, one of the things that was interesting that happened this week uh, to people like ourselves that are kind of seasoned to this type of uh, behavior uh, the media is doing, and, and the Democrats, are doing everything they possibly can to make you take your eye off the ball. I mean, this whole smokescreen with uh, Obama going gay or whatever, you know, with the gay marriage, and the whole thing with, with Mitt Romney uh, with this stupid bullying story uh, is just par for the course, Ward. I mean, it's, uh, and it worked. I mean, I, I watched... To an extent, I think it kind of backfired a little bit. I think so, too, but it, it had people... We're not talking about the debt, you know. We're not talking about the things that are truly important. Uh, and we're we're talking about these hot button issues that, frankly, I don't give a shit about. Yeah, uh, the whole gay marriage thing. It, it, I, I think that they kind of had to come out on that because Biden f- kind of forced their hand. <laughs> he's wonderful, isn't he? He's a yeah. he's a surprise a minute that guy. But I think that that was part of the issue. Is you know that may have been on their roadmap, you know. But I, I think that, that they played the card sooner than they really wanted to just because Joe came out and says, you know, we're all for it. And, yeah. da, da, da. and as soon as he did that, then every speech that the president made was going to be about that. Oh, the next you know, day they had they had gay gay stuff on their website for sale. Yeah, T- I'm out for Obama and yeah. blah, 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 blah. Yeah, whatever. You, you know, know that, that's just stupid shit. And I'll tell you, the thing about it is uh, the uh, as soon as as soon as. Obama came out with that Romney surged Romney I've seen some polls where he's like seven eight points ahead you know and it was directly correlated to that the this whole smoke screen and and ladies and gentlemen I'm not trying to offend anybody here but just the basic truth of the matter is it's not a winning issue in this country and it might be, it might be in a poll where somebody's afraid not to be politically correct but when they get in the voting booth it's never been voted up the, the bottom line is th- it's a state's rights issue. The president mm-hmm. has absolutely no bearing on it whatsoever, and anybody that believes he does is sorely mistaken. Uh, there have been referendums that have come up in many states, and some you know some have passed, some have been defeated. I don't think any of them have passed, it, have they? I mean, if yeah, it, it went down in flames in California of all places. Uh, yeah, but like I think Vermont, it passed oh, in maybe. Vermont. And, and I think it passed in like Connecticut or something like that, or Massachusetts. It's fringe to say the best. Though. Yeah. I mean, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's still the bottom line is it's a, it's a states' rights issue. Yeah, the it states is. are the ones that should have that, sure. that mandate that they they're the same states that mandate whether or not you can marry your cousin. I mean, it's that's the state's law. Now, unfortunately, it's, what's happening with it though is uh, they can't get it on the referendum uh, by and large, so they're trying to take it to the courts. And that, that's what they're hoping for. They're hoping for and, a rogue justice to uh, and just. The thing is, the, the the federal Supreme Court's not going to hear the case. No, but I mean because the, the federal Supreme Court's going to say it's a states' rights issue. Right, but anyway, it 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 was successful in having us talk about something that is really pretty much ridiculous. I mean, yeah, I mean you're absolutely right. It it it's they will talk about anything that they can to, uh, you know keep from talking about the economy sure. to keep from talking about you know uh uh jp morgan just losing what six billion dollars or something we're talking about europe i mean in europe right now uh europe is very disturbing if you see what's going on in europe europe is like the united states but accelerated 
you know they're they're our future oh yeah because they've been they've been dealing with this socialist type government for a, a lot longer than we have you know uh you know they've had socialized medicine and we see how well that's worked yeah. out because anybody who gets sick overseas comes here greece anybody is about ready sick, to tank they're out of money I anything, mean, anybody gets sick in Canada, they came here. Yeah. I mean, that's the bottom line. You know, anybody, you could say whatever you want in socialized medicine and, you know, the, the but you Castro could really, got it right. You could be really, really socialist and be like uh, Hugo Chavez and your only option is to go to Cuba. Yeah. He has to go to Cuba for his cancer treatments. Yeah. So that, that's scary in itself. Yeah, uh, that's exactly where I want to go for, you yeah. know radiation treatments. <laughs> but the thing is, is that the, the thing I can't understand, these people are so screwed up in Europe that they see this at their gate. They see the austerity measures that never even really occurred. I mean, they're doing austerity measures and raising taxes, uh, which is a, a recipe for failure. But they're all moving left. In Germany, yeah. and in, in France just had an election and elected the socialists. Germany, a big state in Germany, just wants socialists. And it's like... Uh, we got to hurry up and separate ourselves from them. I don't even, <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of different reasons, but uh, well, I mean, it, it's one of them things where the it, it's sad that the electorate out there doesn't understand simple economics, and it's right. Okay, well, Sarkozy was mean, and he didn't give us, you know, all it's these coffee breaks and all this stuff that we want, so. We're going to go even further to the left because oh. Sarkozy was a lefty, but we're going to go even further left than him, and the, the, the government's going to take care of us. You know, in France, Bottom you can't is, fire somebody. Run, yeah, if you own a, out of money. If you own a company, you can't fire somebody without going through this board or some type of uh, bureaucracy. Yeah. Uh, and there's something else about any company over 50 people. You wouldn't believe how many 49 people companies they have. You know, oh, they have they, they have rules, Hutch, that are just so ridiculous. Uh, it is. It's I, nice. I, rules I think they only work a 25-hour work week. And, and the Democrat the left here would love to impose those rules on us. They would love nothing better. Yeah, they want they want to take care of us. They, sure. They want to, they want to shelter us. <laughs> if you believe that, I, I got a bridge to sell you. Because really? Because the, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That you know that they're going to be able to 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 basically support everybody in this country, you know. And where's the money going to come from? You know, you have this handful of, of wealthy people. You know, the, the, there was a uh, a thing that just came up last week. Uh, the number of uh, people who are who are basically turning in their citizenship. Yeah, it's going up too. It is going up crazy because these people are like, hey, you it's know, like what? in the thousands, and it's never been there before. Yeah, I'm a billionaire. Why am I going to stay here and, and and be punished for being a billionaire? Right, and and not only punished financially, but being demonized every day. Yeah, you know, and, having protests and, going out to people's houses and whatnot. America is sick, and and they're getting to the point where it's you know what? Hey, the hell with this. I'm going to go to to a country that will appreciate, yeah. you know, the money I give them and you know the taxes. You know, because if you live in California right now, California, oh. Jerry Bryan just came out and they're sick. What was it? Six billion in the 16. hole. Sixteen. Sixteen. His, I, I his, budget is a, his budget is, uh, he has a deficit of $16 billion. Okay, now here, here's, here's Uncle Wardy's solution to that. Number one, get rid of the illegal aliens. All the illegal aliens that you have in your prisons are what's keeping, you know, I mean, that's a huge, huge weight that's, oh, being, yeah. that's being picked up by the taxpayer. And because nobody wants to be the bad guy, nobody wants to draw the line, you know, if if you are if if you're in this country illegally, it's called an illegal immigrant for a reason. Yeah, you know, the fact law. that in California they call them undocumented workers, that translates to illegal alien. Yeah. So. And uh, it, something has to be done about it. But people, like you said, people have to wake up. The electorate. Uh, two plus two must always equal four, fellas. People, I mean. Yeah. It's just the way it is. Now, this time of year is an interesting time of year. I got a a, uh, a lead on an email, but I'm going to save that till the end. Uh, this time of year, they're starting already. You're starting to see the left is coming unglued. They're starting to realize, and I said this before with a little bit of timidity, and I'm not fully behind it yet, but I would, I think that this is going to be an election of epic proportions. I just do. I think that we're going to, right where 2010 left off, you look at what happened in Wisconsin, 
uh, and you look at what happened in North Carolina and West Virginia, we're going to talk about uh, the TV correspondents and even the politicians are going loony. Well, you, what you're trying to say is it's going to be a landslide of epic Absolutely. proportions, very similar to the landslide that ousted Jimmy Carter. Yeah, except and, it's and going to be even better. And that's another thing I, I wanted to bring up because I don't think we have a story about it. But uh, lately in uh, Romney's, uh, you know, on the stump, he's been tying Obama to Jimmy Carter. As well he should. I, I would be. You know, I mean, the, the policies are basically the same as when Carter was in, you know, it's I, like, okay, here, here we go again. In it's all actuality, same. Obama is much worse. I mean. Oh, he's much worse. But, you know, I mean, as bad as Jimmy, Jimmy Carter, Carter was, this guy is twice as bad. Jimmy Carter got worse as he's gotten older, too. He is a complete oh, yeah, anti-Israel. He might as well be in the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah, he, you know, he's, crazy. he's one of those guys that worships the, in the church with the snakes and shit, isn't he? <laughs> you know? That might be. I don't know. <laughs> but I was in his hometown one time in America's Georgia. That's about a rural sucker there. Uh, but, yeah, the correspondence, the Sergeant Schultzes and Chris Matthews and CNN had a lady on there the other day. She totally shut the guy off that was trying to talk about Romney. You know, they have it in their head that this guy's going to be immaculated again, and it's not going to happen, man. This guy's yeah. going. He's going, I'm, and I think he's going to go big, and well, I think he's yeah, going to take a lot of people with him. It's one of them cases where you know when you promise somebody something, all yeah. right, for the for the you know two years running up to the to the actual election, he promised people something, you know. Now he's had four years and he hasn't delivered any of it. You know, we're going to be the most transparent government. He's so ever. full of it, I know. I mean, I you would know, concentrate. Where, where is that? I wouldn't concentrate so heavy on uh, Jimmy Carter. I'd concentrate on Bill Ayers. Than the head of the Black Panther Party and the people right. that he's—that's who I'd concentrate well, on. You start on Jimmy Carter because you have Carter good too. around his neck. That's that's bad enough. <laughs> yeah, but Carter's then, good. You you keep going further. You know, it, we're still early in, in you know there yeah. hasn't been a debate. During the debates is when you you start hanging Bill Ayers on him. And It'll you start be fun. Hanging. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eric sent a, an email to the show. I don't know if he sent it to the show or to me, but it's going to be like it's to the show uh, with a story attached. Now, what happened was. Now this is a teachable moment. This is this is uh, where I'm going to define, well, where I'm going to describe why libertarianism is a failure in my book. That's what I'm going to do because what happened was uh, there was a Army Lieutenant Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Matthew A. Dooley, Joint Ch Joint Staff Forces College presentation on a counter jihad operation design model, and what it is is it it basically describes. Uh, what our military, it's a planning thing. I mean, nobody's doing this. It's, this is just what military planners do. They have a plan for <laughs> every plan, single there's thing. There's a plan for a plan, yeah. For every single possibility, there's a plan. And the possibilities are that all of the world, the global Islamists, unite. And we have open warfare against them. And this plan lays out how to beat them. You know, and it's kind of controversial. Uh, not to me, it's not. I mean, I've been... I've been thinking like this for years. I mean, I, you can see, if you listen to this show regularly and you don't think that we're full of shit, uh, we've put things out there that show where these people want to go. And there's no, no question about it. All you have to do is look in Europe. You look in Germany, you look in, uh, in Scandinavia, in different countries. France. You know, they, they have no, no, Greece. no uh, Christian zones, like all Muslim zones. You can't even go in them. They're, they're freaking enslaving... Uh, Caucasian, young Caucasian girls making them uh, sex slaves. And it's, uh, I'm telling you, there's going to come a time where we need to have somebody be a man and plan this. And and that's what happened. And the, the reason I said about libertarianism, because uh, here was the email. While I send this to you in a spirit of disapproval, I'm sure it will make your day. <laughs> and uh, it says, U.S. military taught officers use Hiroshima tactics for total war on Islam. And like I said, it was a planning document, and there was a couple a couple uh, parameters that had to be met. Uh, some actions offered for consideration here will be seen as not politically correct in the eyes of many, both inside and outside the United States. Uh, examples, decision points considered in Phase 3, where Saudi Arabia threatened with starvation, Mecca and Medina destroyed, Islam reduced to cult status. Uh, this model presumes Geneva Convention 4, 1949 standards of armed conflict 
and the pursuant UN endorsements of it are now due to current common practices of Islamic terrorists no longer relevant or respected globally. This would leave open the option once again of taking war to a civilian population wherever necessary. The historical precedents of Dresden, Tokyo, Hiroshima, Nagasaki being applicable to the Mecca and Medina destruction in Phase 3. This model presumes we have already failed at Phase 1 deterrence. Therefore, Phase 1 is not shown as part of this operation design framework. The model restates previous internationally accepted Geneva Conventions for protections afforded to combatants captured in uniform and reiterates removal of protections for those who are caught fighting operating out of uniform, spies, terrorists, criminals. Against non-state actors due to the Geneva Conventions of 1949 now need redefinition clarification. And uh, like I said, the, the reason that I don't see how you could be against having a plan to fight four billion people. No, you always have to have a plan. And I I think it was earlier in one of the earlier episodes on the show, I even said that. And I came out very vocally for the fact that what we do is we tell, you know, all these, you know, we, we broadcast it in, in all the Arab-speaking countries. If there is one more terrorist attack against the United States of America, we will make Mecca glow. Yeah, and I mean this whole and, idea. And, and you state it. Point blank, and you broadcast it across the uh, the entire middle in, across the entire world. If there is another terrorist attack against the United States, Mecca will fucking glow, and it'll be useless for five thousand years. Yeah, and what we've you done? You want to take us? You want to dare us? The Muslim Brotherhood yeah, has infiltrated the United States government so bad uh, that the course first reported by Danger Room last month and held at the Defense Department's Joint Forces Staff College has since been canceled by the Pentagon brass. It's only now, however, that the details of the class have come to light. Danger Room received hundreds of pages of course material, and I mean, it goes on and on, and it lays it out, and it does a pretty good job of uh, planning something that I think is going to come. I mean, maybe it won't, but I think it's going to. I mean, I, I don't... Th this government, the way that we react to these people, when you act like... <laughs> Just because something's a religion that you can't, that can't be your enemy, and you read their, their writings, they're clearly our enemy. And, and we're just, there's people that are rolling over that it just, it, it, it drives me crazy. Yeah. In case you didn't notice. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it doesn't take a whole lot. Cause so anyway, my point there. was, my point on the, on the libertarianism thing is, is that, you know, it would be nice if everybody in the world would make nice. But there's people out there that are planning our destruction right now. And to sit here and act like they're not uh, is just being brain dead to me. Well, yeah, I mean, and we've said that before about Ron Paul. Ron Paul's... All libertarian, uh, domestic, anybody who feels well, that way. I mean, he, he's he's their their leader, the, yeah. the leader of the libtards. And he's the guy who, who everybody looks to and says, what would, what would Ron Paul do? Well, Ron Paul like I've said a uh, hundred times on the show, has great domestic policy. His foreign policy stinks. Ron Paul you would get the body bags you out. can't cover your eyes and say, well, Iran's not going to do anything because we can't see them do anything. If they get a bomb, as soon as they get a bomb, they're going to launch it at Israel. As soon as they launch it at Israel, one's coming our way. And I said that, it That's why first... they made the deal with, with Chavez. There's nukes in Venezuela pointed at us right now. At least and rockets. Anybody that I don't, don't believe know. that's immoral. I mean, uh, my first statement on Ron Paul was, was you know, this guy, I might, you know, listen to some of these things, but he does not understand Islam. And you can't understand. be in charge if you don't understand Islam. I'm sorry. He doesn't understand foreign policy at all. You know, but especially, I mean, this is something that, uh, anyway, these Ron Paul people, you know, they're, they they booed Romney, uh, Romney's son off the stage in Arizona the other day. What they're doing is they're stealthily going into these, conventions and they're like uh masters that they figured out the math at the conventions there's some kind of a way that you can get three percent of the vote and, and get 50 percent of the delegates which is a total travesty to me i mean when you have romney winning at arizona by whatever margin he did and not getting that amount of delegates because there's a couple slicksters that are going into the convention yeah they booed romney's son right off the stage the other day it's something, and they won the delegates in Maine and Nevada, too, and they didn't win either one of those states. I don't think they won Maine. They didn't win any states, did they? No. No. 
You know, so that's something that we're going to have to watch. And they're doing I, I it here. Ron they're, Paul has won a state. He has a couple delegates because he he's placed. But he's got he's know. got a percentage of delegates going to this convention in Tampa because of what they're doing in these conventions. You know, but uh, that's yeah, something maybe we'll, we'll we'll look into that a little a little heavier this week. I think because I've heard it several times, and and it, when they when they report on it, it sounds like he has the majority of the delegates. You know, I don't know if that's accurate, but it's uh. They're backdooring this thing. It's it's uh, disruptive to say the least. They're not helping anybody. You guys that are out there for Ron Paul, I mean, God bless you, but you're not. All you're going to do is fracture the opposite, the, the opposition to the communist, and you're going to end up with a communist if you're successful. You know, think about yeah, that. Because if Ron Paul runs as a third party candidate, it's the same as Ross Perot. It ends up That's fracturing right. the Republican vote, and what's going to happen is. Uh, Obama gets reelected. Go back, go back, and start over in four years, and get your shit together and win something, and then that's different. And then maybe you can run Rand Paul. You know you something. Know, Ron, Ron might be old. Maybe Rand will say, "Okay, I'll I'll run." Maybe I'd vote for campaigns. him too. I don't know. You know, but but right now the only the only hope for the United States is Mitt Romney. Ron Paul is not going to be the president. No. If that makes you stay home, then stay home. His foreign policy it will be is detrimental to this country. Right, and he doesn't have a following that's that big. I mean, you guys are are, are loyal, and that's that's good, but this isn't your time. You know, if it was, then you'd be the front runner. That's the way we do things in the United States. You know. Anyway, the weekly jihad report: forty jihad attacks, eight Allah Akbar's, which are suicide attacks, two hundred and twenty dead bodies and 407 critically injured, directly related to the religion of peace. Uh, and, and, and now remember, Hutch, we, we got to say that that was from April 28th till May 4th. Right, yeah, so, we're a week so behind. So we're about there. a week behind. Hutch, puts all, Hutch is the one compiling all these numbers. And so th these are, are up till May 4th, yep. so 10 days ago. So we're, uh, we'll keep that coming unless somebody complains, and then we'll do it twice. Uh, anyway, Ward, you have a story that we're going to introduce with an audio clip here. So let's uh, see if we can make that work, and I'll bet we can. Let's listen to the audio. Uncle Sam's Unlimited Plan, how the government's cell phone giveaway is costing you billions. In this week's edition, we'll look at how a government program designed to help low-income individuals has become the latest example of wasteful spending. Get your free government phones today! Only CBS Atlanta uncovers that you are paying for people to get cell phones. The money comes from a hidden fee that's on your cell phone bill every single month. Complete strangers getting free cell phones, and you are paying for it. Why taxpayers are subsidizing someone else's phone habit. The answer might upset you. Serious fraud with the program. Surprise, surprise, and guess who's paying for it? You and I. Nolik Nelson got a free phone, 100 free minutes, and 300 free tax. Or, but we found multiple phones being given away to people who already have a free phone, or people who don't need them or even want them. An investigation by our sister station in Baltimore found people were getting multiple phones for free. One woman admitted she got 30 phones at no cost. Even Darlene Nelson admits she does have another phone, but it's one she pays for, and says this one will be for emergencies. The more phones they give away, the more you pay. If we can't cut this, then we're in big, big trouble when it comes to cutting other wasteful spending because this is this is easy. Congressman Tim Griffin is leading the way in reforming this program. He's introduced the Stop Taxpayer Funded Cell Phones Act which will end abuse while protecting those who need the program by restoring it to its original intent. End Uncle Sam's Unlimited Plan. Like Tim on Facebook to learn how. Well, that's something. That's uh, incredible to say the least. That's costing a lot of money, too. Yeah, and, and the thing is, here's the part that gets me. I, You know, I can understand... You know, them saying, okay, well, somebody, everybody needs to have a phone in case of an emergency. I'm all behind that. There's absolutely no reason that they can't have a, a home phone, 
a wired phone in their house. There's no reason that they need to have a cell phone. We got along fine without them for 200 years. <laughs> yeah. They, I mean, you can't give me any scenario that explains why they need a cell phone with you know, text messaging and internet connection and all, all the bells and whistles that I pay for. Why did that lady want 30 of them? Is she running a That's drug operation or what? I'll bet, yeah, they're burn phones, dude. You, you get it, you use it for a little bit, you toss it so that the cops can't chase you. Unbelievable. You going to follow through with this story or is that good? I think that's good. I, I mean, it, it's one of them things where uh, Tim Griffin, uh, the Republican from Arizona, introduced the Stop Taxpayer Funded Cell Phones Act to prohibit universal service support of commercial mobile service to the Lifeline program. <laughs> Bottom line is... If people need a phone, you know, for me to have a phone in my house was like 14 bucks a month. And for me to have my cell phone and, you know, the cell phone plan and whatnot, it's about 100 bucks. Yeah. But that is a luxury that I can afford to pay for myself. Someone who does not have a job that should not be afforded that luxury. If you want a, a home phone for in, in case of emergencies because you're getting robbed or whatever, fine. Put a put a home phone in that hits the taxpayer for fourteen bucks. Yeah, but when you give them a cell phone and a cell phone plan, you're talking hundreds of dollars that you're that you're throwing out on somebody who who doesn't have you know that's so uh, downtrodden that they can't afford to have their own phone. Yeah, it's silly. Well, we'll have to pay attention to that. See if he gets any traction. I hope he does. A fifty-two-year-old felon with a ponytail, a mullet. A 210-month federal prison sentence and surprising amount of political experience gave President Barack Obama a serious fight Tuesday night in West Virginia's Democratic primary election. With 47 of 55 counties reporting their results, Keith Russell Judd had collected 55,592 votes statewide, or 42.8% of the total. Although party rules would award Judd at least one Democratic National Convention delegate for winning more than 15% of the vote, it's unclear whether he would be whether he would actually have a voice at the Charlotte, North Carolina event, since no one has volunteered to represent him as a delegate. Still, the ultimate up outsider was leading Obama in eight counties late Tuesday night. Mess around with their coal, oh. <laughs> as disaffection with the president grows nationwide, Obama has already suffered one embarrassing defeat in Oklahoma, where anti-abortion activist Randall Terry won 18% of the votes in that state's March primary contest. Judd, otherwise known as Prisoner 11593-051 at the Beaumont Federal Correction Institute, Institution in Texas, is serving time for mailing a threatening communication with intent to extort money or something of value in New Mexico. He was arrested in 1995 and convicted in 1999 that shows you how uh, efficient our court system is. He was arrested in 1995 and convicted in 1999, four, so four years, years later. In 2000, a federal appeals court noted that he had already filed 36 notices of appeal and no less than 180 motions, all unsuccessfully. So that's uh, well, that, you know, Hutch, with with that kind of a record, he's he's bound to be a politician. I'll tell you though, that that's got to be they they had to be crying in the White House. That is embarrassing. I can't think of anything more embarrassing than that. I mean, a federal inmate, forty two percent of the vote, and they just voted in a Democrat senator. Yeah, you know, Manchin, and Manchin said that he's not voting for Obama. He won't say who he voted for in that primary. You know, he might have voted for the felon. Yeah, I mean, send the message. I mean, that's what that's what has to happen. They have to see, you know, loud and clear that even the, and, and that's the thing, you know, that forty-two percent that that voted for the felon, it's going to be a lot more that vote for a Republican. Oh yeah, I mean, in in uh, Wisconsin, they had the recall primary, and last week, and and what happened was the union candidate. I don't think we have a story about this. The union candidate that they backed with millions of dollars. All the unions in the country pushed this person, and they lost. They only got like 30% of the vote out of Democrats. And then there was a couple other candidates, and the one guy won that, that like distanced himself from the union. But Walker, who didn't, nobody needed to go out and vote for Walker. He was the only guy on the ticket. He was going to win with one vote. 
they got almost as many votes for Walker as all those Democrats combined. That's amazing. Yeah. That really is. I mean, that's something that uh, the writing's on the wall. I mean, all you got to do is read it. It's out there. This is going to be uh, pretty interesting to watch. Let's take it back to Arizona, Ward. Yeah, the Justice Department plans to sue Arizona Sheriff Arpaio. Sheriff Joe, he's in trouble again. Federal authorities said Wednesday that they plan to sue Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio and his office over allegations of civil rights violations, including the racial pro profiling of Latinos. The U.S. Justice Department has been seeking an agreement requiring Arpaio's office to train officers in how to make constitutional traffic stops, collect data on people arrested in traffic stops, and reach out to Latinos to assure them that the department is also there to protect them. Arpaio has denied the racial profiling allegations and has claimed that allowing a court monitor would mean that every pol policy decision would have to be cleared through an observer and would nullify his authority. DOJ officials told a lawyer for Arpaio on April 3rd that the lawman's refusal of court-appointed monitor was a deal-breaker and that would end settlement negotiations and, a res and result in a federal lawsuit. The notice of intent to file civil action came Wednesday from an assistant U.S. Attorney General Thomas Perez uh, in a letter to Arpaio's lawyer. At a news conference Wednesday afternoon, Arpaio defended himself in the face of the pending lawsuit. If they sue, we'll go to court, and then we'll find out the real story. There's lots of miscommunications emanating from Washington. They broke off communications. They're telling me how to run my organization. I'd like to get this resolved, but I'm not going to give up my authority to, a, to the federal government. It's just as simple as that. Um, Good for him. I mean, yeah. This guy's my hero. I like this guy, and he'll fight back. He told Eric Holder, you get your house in order before you come down to my house. I, and I'll tell you what. I can guarantee you they start going after Arpaio, you know, and, and trying to, to slap him around. He's going to be going, okay, where's the birth certificate? Yeah, I think you're going to see Eric why, Holder fired. Why is he, why, I mean, that's what I do. I mean, if, if I'm Joe, I'd say, okay, Justice Department, you're looking at me because my sheriffs may have stopped some people. Why is it you're allowing the president of the United States to have issued a forged birth certificate? Yeah. As and claims it's. Legitimate? I think they bit Why off more than they could chew, it? man. This guy is. This guy doesn't get reelected sheriff for no reason. I mean, he's a tough guy. He he might have a little bit of a cartoonish look to him, but I'll tell you what. But the thing is, the people in Arizona love. You're him. messing with the wrong guy right there. I mean, he's not a Arizona love him because he gets results and he tells the truth. I mean, he really does. He's he's a exceptional guy. Now, there's all kind of things going on uh, politically this week. We were, we were talking about it on Facebook a little bit. Luger out of the Senate after six terms. A funny thing happened on the way to the funeral for the Tea Party movement. Yes, with the Jurassic media. I like that Jurassic media. I'm going to start using that full of stories about the demise of the movement. Darned if they didn't pull off one of their most significant wins last night in Indiana as Senator Dick Luger is now done in the Senate after 36 years. And one of the reasons he's done, I mean, uh, more significant than Murdoch, that's the guy who beat him, Murdoch's win, of course, is Luger's loss. This is a stinging rebuke to business as usual for the GOP and a reminder that while the insiders got their man for the top of the ticket, that the resistance is far from done. Hell, it launched this show, Ward. Luger right. deserved to lose if for no other reason than he ran a shameful anti-Paul Ryan, anti-Tea Party, anti-adult campaign. His last flurry of campaign ads demonstrated not only desperation, but it showed the huge chasm between what insider political consultants believe and what voters want. It was the worst kind of pandering to Democrat and other crossover voters, the kind who would never vote Republican in a general election. Meanwhile, in North Carolina last night, there was the oddity of having contested primaries for governor in both parties with the official crashing and burning of the obviously underqualified Beverly Perdue's liberal administration. And even more of an oddity for this state, the GOP winner's primary vote total was roughly twice that of the Democrat winner in another state. Oh, and that winner was Pat McCrory, former mayor of Charlotte, the host city for Obama's convention. He is still very popular in the greater Charlotte area. 
Another good sign that the Tar Heel State will return to the red column in 2012 is that marriage, traditional marriage between one man and one woman, won a convincing state constitutional amendment vote over forces trying to redefine the institution more loosely. Convincing as in Amendment 1 passed 6040. The losers included the last two Democrat presidents, Obama and Clinton, both of whom chimed in on this issue, urging folks to vote against it. Clinton even allowed his voice to be used on robocalls. Obama won the state in 08, and in 1992, Clinton came with half a percentage point of doing so. Any way you analyze it, the results from Indiana and North Carolina last night are good news for conservatives. One of the worst Republicans in the Senate has been removed in a primary fight, and one of the most disappointing states for conservatives in 08 showed more promise of correcting their mistakes. Without a doubt, the status quo and liberalism in general was last night's biggest luger. Uh, Thomas Lifson adds, it wasn't even close. Indiana Republicans gave their Senate nomination to Richard Murdoch by 22 points, 61 to 39 percent of the vote. Confirmation of their wisdom came swiftly as John E. Carey lamented the loss by President Obama's favorite Republican as a tragedy for the Senate. This is tearing them up. I mean, go to the, the uh, show notes link uh, page on the website. Uh, you can read that entire article. But uh, this is just uh, where this is, they're going batshit. I mean, you look at, and this is, this is a problem I have with all these people they keep trumpeting up and putting in front of me as being good Republicans. Mitch Daniels backed that guy. Hook, line, and sinker, Luger. And Mitch Daniels is supposed to be this dynamic guy. Uh, the other guy that backed him was uh, not Paul Ryan, uh, Eric Cantor. You know, these guys, yeah. we, we got to pay attention to these freaking Republicans, man. They're, they're bad news. Well, I mean, that that's part of this entire media fail. You know, the, the dying Tea Party just raised $12 million. Uh, more proof that the media loves to write the reality they desire. Over and over again, we're told by the mainstream media that the Tea Party is dead or dying. Uh, then an entrenched incumbent in Indiana is booted out. And now this. Senator Richard Luger, who lost a primary fight Tuesday, doesn't need any reminders that the Tea Party movement is ongo and Tea Party movement's ongoing appeal. But for those of us who do, here another one has surfaced recently in the tax return of the Tea Party movement's biggest umbrella organization. The Woodstock, Georgia-based Tea Party Patriots reported raising $12.2 million for the year that ended May 31st, 2011. That vaults them into the ranks of some of the most successful conservative activist groups, including Freedom Works, the Club for Growth, and the Americans for Tax Reform. Nonprofit organizations' annual tax returns are lagging indicators, of course, and political fundraising landscape has been evolving rapidly. But the Tea Party Patriots' success underscores the continuing and perhaps ever-growing power of the Tea Party. Wisely, the Tea Party remains leaderless. That, mean, that makes it impossible for the mainstream media to do what it wants to do more than anything. And that's destroy the movement by destroying its leader. Instead, under the radar, one battle at a time, the Tea Party keeps going on winning. Um, winning many more elections than it loses and forever making fools of its primary enemy, the mainstream media it's great i mean and that's absolutely true some of the rants that you hear about the tea party are so just utterly void of any type of reality that it just it's laughable i mean the whole well, race my favorite thing. my favorite part of the whole thing is you get guys like bill moore and and, <laughs> and them you know t talking about well there's the tea baggers the tea baggers are this and the tea baggers that y it's you not know even what? funny yeah, man it's you ain't got the balls to come to, to, into my face I'm Joe Nobody who has a little, you know, internet radio show, and it. And I'll issue a challenge now. If either one of you got the balls to come up and call me a teabagger to my face, and, and and walk away from it, I'll give you a hundred bucks. You know, I'll something. guarantee you, you'll be carried away if you come up and get in my face and call me names. <laughs> this is something. I mean, the, the stuff that they do, and and all it is. I mean, I'm talking about senators and representatives come out and just say the most ridiculous things. Uh, that guy from down in Georgia, down in Atlanta, that thought that the, that Guam was going to capsize, I mean, he's something. He said some. Uh, they all, they're nuts. They're just, uh, and I can't believe there's people, you know. Now, I'm not the kind of person, and most conservatives are not the type of people that would fuck up their cars with a bumper sticker. You know, yeah. I don't put a bumper sticker on my vehicles. But the ones that you do see plastered, these people have, 
I saw one today. He had the Obama and the uh, uh, Obama stop, Biden. Stop Biden. watching Fox now. It's bad news for the country and just all this ridiculous stuff. And it's like, okay, whatever. I mean, you're buying this. I mean, you are really uh, just showing how the public school system has failed. I mean, that's all I can think of. You know, because I don't see how you buy these, these lines. I really don't. I don't see how so many people that we are that stupid in this country would vote for their own suicide. I, di I just can't can't well, fathom that. You know, it, it's one of them things where they, they you know, they're, they're at a point in their life where they're so used to being lied to that another lie doesn't make any difference. And they they you know, believe it. They and, believe and I think that's stuff. what it is because, you know, you look at, at what Obama's done, you know, all every promise that he made before he got into office was a lie. Yeah. Every and, single and, one of them. And not, you not go on our website, said. you go on our website, and Glenn Beck very accurately and historically in their own words shows it. Everything about the man's a lie. Every story he told, every speech he ever told, it's all... Go on the website and check it out. Did you get a chance to watch that word? Yes, I did. That's something, wasn't it? I, I, I yeah, would have liked well, that, to see. That, that was one of the reasons I was kind of hyping that story. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, though. I mean, I was, if I don't like something, I'm not putting it on the website. And I was like, the way he put that out there, Glenn Beck has a pay-per-view internet TV show, which I subscribe to. And then I took my subscription out when he started talking stupid about Newt. And I'll probably put it back on because of the content. But anyway... My point is, is that he doesn't usually share things like that, but he put that out there with an embed button and everything on it. He wanted it to get put out, you know, and I watched it and I said, it's worthy. <laughs> it's definitely worthy. Now, the next story, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. It's kind of like a book review. Uh, uh, R. Emmett Terrell Jr. of uh, American Spectator has written a book called The Death of Liberalism, and this is a very extensive article. Uh, so I'm only going to be able to scratch the surface. I would highly encourage you to go to the show notes link page under uh, American Spectator. Uh, and, and incidentally, before we go too much further, I did get a tweet uh, right before the show from Eric suggesting that instead of listing the news organization where we got the stories from, uh, he thought that I should use the title of the article, and I think that's probably a good idea. So that's what I'm going to start doing. It's just, uh, it just makes it one more step, but... Uh, I'm going to do it anyway, I think. Uh, so you go on there and look for American Spectator, and the author is Jeffrey Lord. Uh, you're going to want to check this out. The characteristics of a baby or child, says Webster's, says Webster's, being infantile is a charming characteristic in a baby or child. In adults, adults charged with the serious responsibility of discussing or actually running public policy, never good. As seen here in this story about Occupy Wall Street, replete with photo of a protester defecating on a police car. Terrell has been observing and writing about this kind of ludicrous behavior that, that he terms the infantile left for some 40 years through the magazine that he created and you are reading American Spectator. What brought this memorable photo of a defecating Occupy protester to mind was reading the stunning pullback and survey, the battlefield book that is Terrell's new book, The Death of Liberalism. The book is nothing less than an autopsy conducted while the battle still rages, an astute recognition that liberalism's defenders are being reduced by the day, if not the hour, to the political equivalent of the survivors of Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg, the latter known to history as the high watermark of the Confederacy. A great swarming savage last assault across the political battlefields into the incessant cannon and rifle fire of the American majority leaving in the aftermath not only massive liberal casualties on the battlefield, but inducing a sense of crippling psychological failure among the liberal survivors, of which, at the moment, the Occupy Wall Street debacle, they of the defecating on police cars and rape tents crowd, is the most vivid example. For a small sample of just how infantile one can see the infantile left at work here in Oakland, California in 2011, in Chicago, at the 68 Democrat National Convention, at the Pentagon in 1967, in Los Angeles in 1992, or all manner of places in 1986 when Ronald Reagan bombed Libya in response to an attack on U.S. military personnel in then West Germany. Here's an interesting one with infantile left expressing itself on the environment. And who could miss these two bookmarks to the career of Massachusetts Senator John Kerry 
during the doing the infantile left gig here as captured in a swift boat ad. There's many links in this story that you're going to have to check out. He windsurfed as a presidential candidate, and there's Hillary as a potential president. The examples are endless, and you can't make it up. The details of the liberal autopsy begin immediately, with Dr. Terrell walking slowly around a figurative steel table, examining the lifeless political course, diligently recording the life of the deceased. Just who were these liberals, anyway? After 40-some-odd years of experience, Terrell knows them well. Liberals who began as the rightful heirs to the New Deal have carried on as a kind of landed aristocracy, gifted but doomed. They dominated the culture of the politics of the country, unchallenged from the beginning of the Cold War to the first Nixon administration. So dominant were they that they could totally pollute the culture with their prejudices and their views. In its place, they created a culture smog, a culture whose contaminants were everywhere in the media, among the literate classes, even among the literates. Everywhere culture smog is the only form of pollution to which the liberals never object. In fact, they deem it healthy. Uh, and again, I don't have enough time to go through this, but it's just a, an excellent chronicling uh, of liberals and, and how, you know, they've, they've pretty much infiltrated everything and plagued by the divisions of race, ideology, and political temperament that dated back to the late 1960s, unable to unite around a coherent set of attitudes, let alone ideas, foreign policy and the military or domestic issues, beholden to a disparate collection of special constituencies and interest groups, each with its own agenda, the quarrelsome Democrats made the fractured Republican Party look like a juggernaut. Uh... Yeah, it's just uh, amazing. This thing, I got to get this book. I, I mean, I, I read a little bit. I don't read as much as I should. Uh, but this this one sounds really good. And he chronicles it. I, again, go to the show notes link page. It's about an eight-page article uh, that I read from one end to the other and, and was looking for more. And Hutz just gave you the Reader's Digest version. So, yeah, and, and that's normally what it is. We, we don't read through the entire stories. Uh, we just don't have time. So we, we give you the Reader's Digest version. We, put the, we post the whole thing on the website. Go to the website, and you, can get, and you can dig down into any story that we talk about. I'll tell you, I was so interested in that last article, Word, that, uh, and you can see on the show notes, I underlined that what I was going to say ten times more than what I said. Because yeah. I just I couldn't I couldn't leave this out and I couldn't leave that I mean it's just a, an amazing article well worth a read, it really is. Uh, I'll be back, Ward. I'm going to go uh, send a check to the Taliban. Yeah, apparently uh, everybody who's listening to this show that that pays their taxes have also sent a, a check to the Taliban. American taxpayers are encountering a, a drumbeat of bad news from Afghanistan. Insurgents are launching coordinated. Complex, complex attacks and implementing record number of IEDs strained more than killing, uh, strained by more than killing a decade of war. U.S. troops are implicated in Koran burning, desecrations, and renegade killings. Today, the news broke that the United States officials, in a futile attempt of hope, of hope of quelling violence, have been party to pernicious catch-and-release system that facilitated the secret release of high-level insurgent detainees who are more than free to strike at American forces again. As American taxpayers try to process these indicators of the failing war, do they also know that their taxes are helped bankrolling the Taliban? Uh, we are conveying, in, we are convoying in the Taliban country in giant armored vehicles, dodging IEDs and keeping watch for ambushes. And soldiers would be sit, were cynically telling me, we're funding both sides of this war, describing the malign nexus of American careerists, Afghan kleptocrats, and wily insurgents, as akin to the mafia. The infantry grunts would. Sp Bit their skull in empty water bottles and ruefully say, we are funding our own enemy. The system is so routine, uh, there are Taliban business offices in Kabul and Kandahar mm -hmm. where contractors take their U.S. funded contracts to negotiate percentages with jihadist engineers. Mm -hmm. Security firms commonly contract, uh, contract with Afghan insurgents to protect U.S. funded de development projects. 
the notoriously wasteful 64-mile-long Ghost Gartes Road uh, project is expected to cost taxpayers $176 million. Over $43 million went to a security firm, which then hired an insurgent leader who was on the U.S. JPEL killer capture list. They paid the jihadi $160,000 a month to provide security against himself. Now, doesn't that sound like the mafia, you know? Yeah, uh, I mean, it is. The, the, this whole thing, I, I said, I don't it's know. Extortion. I don't know if we had started the show yet or not, but there was a Marine captain that uh, did his tour, and then he went back to Afghanistan, Afghanistan as a State Department employee. And he resigned after so long because he realized that this was futile. You know, describing the tribal populations and everything, it's just uh, bad news. Well, it's one of the cases where, you know, we're going in and saying, okay, well, we'll give you, you know, a hundred. Uh, this road's going to cost us a million bucks. So we'll give you a million bucks to build the road. And they go, no. Yeah, it doesn't take long to figure us out, man. I mean. Because, well, in order for us to build the road, we have to pay off the Taliban so they don't blow holes in it. Yeah. All right, so what's that going to cost? Now it's $2 million to build a million-dollar road. And, and, and I'm using very loose math. I'm, I, it's way more money than that. But it, it's still the point of we're paying them. They're taking our money, protecting us from them. From them. I mean, it, it's kind of like the old mafia thing where you're paying protection. You know, I'm, I'm going to give you 20 bucks so that you don't come and beat me up and take 50. Yeah, and I mean, Afghans of all persuasions increasingly want foreign troops out of their country. U.S. polls show rapidly increasing support for accelerated troop withdrawal. You know, wearying of multiple deployments and flawed policies, many American soldiers are ready to come home. That's a fact. <laughs> More than one soldier told me in Afghanistan, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. American taxpayers certainly would agree with them. Uh, yeah, it's something. I don't know how that's going to how that's going to end up. I, I don't know. I just uh at least we're not getting slaughtered. That's all I can say. We're not getting beat the way the Russians were. Yeah, no, we we've already kicked their ass. I mean, it, the, the that's 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 scared the hell out of the Russians. Not only the Russians, that's scared the hell out of Libya. Because, you know, we went in there and we did in 30 days what the Russians couldn't do in 3 years. And that kind of made Gaddafi's eyes open up. And it, right after we invaded Afghanistan and, and basically 30 days later, we're you know, running the show. That's when old Muammar Gaddafi came out and says, hey, whatever you want, I'll give you all the intel. I'll old give you whatever Momo. you need. You know, he was, he was ready to give it. You know, he was giving away his kids and yeah, shit. He was. All right, the last story of the day here of the week, American sovereignty lost at sea. Senator Dick Luger's defeat in a Republican primary this week has not been attributed as nearly as we can tell to his 1979 trip to Moscow with Joe Biden. Then the two members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee left the bosses of the Kremlin with the distinct impression that they cared about arms control and not so much about human rights. Claire Berlinski's article in the spring 2010 issue of City Journal ought to be disqualifying. Nor, it seems, did the senators spearheading of the ill-advised START treaty with the Russians in a lame duck, lame duck session in December 2010 lead to his loss by a stunning 61 to 39 percent vote to a Tea Party-backed challenger. Last week's primary seems to have turned on Luger's 36-year tenure, the addition of some 13 trillion in debt while he held his seat, most of that time as Indiana's senior senator. As he conceded the election, Luger sternly cautioned the victor, Indiana State Treasurer Richard Murdoch, on bipartisanship, on the need to compromise to get things done. I hate that. Bipartisanship is fine when it is based on real principle. We can point to the Reagan tax cuts, the welfare reform bills, and the Defense of Marriage Act as examples of fruitful principled bipartisanship. The Senate was right to ratify Reagan's INF treaty with the Soviets. Conservatives should not reflexively reject all bipartisanship or oppose any international treaties. But the so-called, now pay attention to this, ladies and gentlemen, the so-called Law of the Sea Treaty, LOST, needs to be extensively modified, if not rejected altogether. 
30 years ago, President Reagan wisely shelved this UN project. He viewed it as most Americans who have serious concerns about that world body viewed it as a typical example of liberal internationalist globaloni. Jimmy Carter, probably sensing that he would get the boot from American voters, began trolling for votes on the Nobel Peace Prize Committee through such ill-considered measures. First, we need to throw overboard any international tribunal for the law of the sea. The UN would choose this maritime court. How do we like the UN Human Rights Council? That body contains such human rights offenders as China, Cuba, Saudi Arabia, and until it was just too blatantly obvious to continue, Libya. If this is the UN's idea of human rights, can we imagine what a law of the sea tribunal would look like? Perhaps we could persuade Johnny Depp to do a star turn with his fellow pirates of the Caribbean as judges of the sea. That would be a tribunal less hostile to justice than anything we'd see a UN-nominated and elected, elected maritime court. Second, we need to scrap any discovery provisions and legal proceedings under lost. These can be used by those who wage lawfare against the United States and its NATO allies to uncover sensitive national security documents. Muslim Brotherhood come to mind? Uh, so this is just something that, that we need to pay attention to. The author, Ken Blackwell, is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Bob Morrison is a veteran of the United States Coast Guard. I mean, if this is the UN's idea of human rights, you know, I already read that. Uh, this one needs a stake through its heart. It's bad enough that the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee has been headed for a decade by such high taxers as Joe Biden, Dick Luger, and John Kerry. We should not let them bootstrap another taxing authority onto Americans via the back door of an international treaty. If this is not the camel's nose under the American tent, it is surely the international octopus tentacle into the Yankee boat. Just as we need to resist Sharia creeping into American courts, we should resist a so-called law of the sea treaty being rushed through in another lame duck Senate this year. For a generation, the late Senator Jesse Helms was the eagle who watched over American sovereignty. Jesse would keep the Senate in session into the wee hours of Christmas morning, if he had to, in order to protect our independence. It was Helms who once said, I have no argument with the State Department. I just wish they'd open up an American desk. Senator Helms is gone. Now America's independence and sovereignty must be watched over by each one of us. So we're going to have to keep our eyes on this lost treaty. It's, it sounds pretty uh, despicable to me. Well, I mean, that's one of the things that, that I've been you know, complaining about, hoping for, praying for, whatever you want to call it for, for a while now, is that we abandon the uh, United Nations. We take the United Nations and say, you know what, I think you should move to Geneva, you know, move them to Switzerland, whatever, get the hell out of New York, send, you know, if, if you guys want to rule, you know, you, you want to have some kind of whatever. I mean, really, the, the UN without us is nothing. And, and with it, us, it, all it, it is, is it's an anti-American club. It's an anti-American club that we pay for. Right, it's, it's that embarrassing. That the taxpayers pay for so that they could have houses and, and uh, embassies and, and these hot shots, crimes. These hotshots come over to New York, and, I mean, they're looting their own people. You yeah. Know, and they spend just huge sums of money on uh, penthouse hotel suites and the whole floor. Hookers. Yeah, hookers, gambling, the whole nine yards. They, they preach all this stuff to their populations, and then they come here and, and enter Sodom and Gomorrah themselves, well, you know? And then on top of that, you, you get guys, you know, like the, the president of Iran coming to our house. Yeah. He, coming to our house and then spitting on us. Between him and, and Chavez. Yeah. You, you know what? That's another reason you you pick the damn thing up, you move it out. Uh, Move it to fucking Venezuela. That's an expensive it, it, building, too. I mean, that whole operation is expensive. Hell yeah, and we pay for it. We pay for the security. It's ridiculous, I know. We pay for, we pay for uh, the, it's like a membership. We have to pay for our membership. We have to pay for all these other people, for hotel rooms, for security. For I think we're all funding this other stuff. like 30%. And then, on, on top of that, we're the, we're the teeth of the U.N. So right. when the U.N. goes, finally, hey, you know what? We've tried all this diplomatic crap. It don't work. We need somebody to go in and slap them around. Who's going to go in? Yeah. Who's going to go in? I mean, this stuff, this stuff always comes up when there's a left-wing administration. I mean, I remember the controversy uh, of the blue helmets when Clinton yeah. was in, you know, and, you know, like giving was, up our leadership of our military units to some freaking doofus from Belgium. 
You yeah, know, that, it's that's ridiculous. The biggest, biggest bunch of sh bullshit ever. I agree. US I, I think they should close it. Managed by U.S. commanders. Absolutely, and I think it was blocked. I don't think it ever happened, but I'm not positive. Oh no, 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 no! The U.N. was definitely running the show in Kosovo. Were they? Oh yeah. I wasn't there, so I'll believe it though. Uh, okay, Ward. Well, I guess we uh, managed. We we have perfected the time management section of the uh, production uh, down to 15 seconds. That's pretty good. That's uh, damn good. Since we talked, we talked for a half hour before we even started. This <laughs> that's the way it's designed. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, send us an email: steelcityresistance at gmail dot com. Uh, go over to Freedom Connector and and join Steel City Resistance. Haven't had anybody join there in a while. Uh, what else are we doing? We're, we're all over the place. You can hit us on Facebook, facebook.com slash SteelCityResistance. You can uh, tweet if you want us to, to pick up your tweets and check them out. Use pound S-C-R-P-G-H. Yeah, we'll try our best to get There's it on. the here. hashtag. I, I monitor those. Ha I, that's the only hashtag I actually follow. So if, if you don't tag it with that, I'm never going to see it. There you go. So there it is. Uh, we appreciate it. Oh, call the show, 412-254-3750. Keep it under two minutes. Uh, just an administrative note, there's not going to be a show next Sunday. Uh, I'm going to talk to Ward after the program, and we'll figure out when it's going to be. But I'm not going to be in the area, so these things happen. Thank you for uh, allowing us into your life for an hour. And, Ward, if you don't have anything else. No, sir, I'm over and out. That'll do it.